Welcome to Haven Heights Baptist Church. Welcome to those who are here and welcome to those listening online. Today we started back with Sunday School. If you'd like to join us next week, we are meeting at 9.30 following social distancing guidelines. Adults are meeting here in the sanctuary. Youth are meeting in the youth room. And children are meeting in the fellowship hall. If you didn't make it this morning, please consider joining us next week. And now let's take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship comes from John chapter 15, verse 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's pray. Father God, it is true. Apart from you, we can do nothing. We cannot give life. You are the giver of life. You are the one who sustains us. You are the sustainer. We cannot even do good works. You are the giver of good works. We are totally dependent upon you for all that we have. And apart from you, we can do nothing. Because we are utterly and completely dependent upon you this day, we pray to you. And we pray for those who are having difficulty at work. We pray for those who are looking for work. And we pray for those considering career changes. We are reminded that apart from you, we can do nothing. And so we pray for your help. And would you lead, guide, and direct? And would you provide for your own? We pray for those who are having family difficulties. We think of parents struggling with children and children struggling with parents. We think of those who are having difficulty with their spouses. Father, you know every situation. You know every struggle. And we admit this morning that we are powerless to change it. And yet we pray to you because you can. And so we pray that by your grace, we pray that you would change these relationships through us. Show us the next step and cause us to be obedient. We pray for those who do not know you. We pray that your spirit would blow and cause new life as only you can. And as we share our faith with these folks, we pray that your spirit would give us the very words to say. We pray for those in our faith family who are ill this morning. Father, we cannot heal ourselves, but you can. And so we pray that our prayer offered in faith would make the sick person well. And Father, this morning we praise you that Diane Klingeman and Larry Hendricks are now home from the hospital. And we thank you for your good work in their lives. As we give our tithes and our offerings, we are reminded that only you can use these funds to bear fruit in your kingdom. And so we pray that these monies given would be used to spread your gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray for the preaching of your word, and we pray that you would give us ears to hear, and we pray for your help to preach with clarity. We ask for your grace because even hearing from you requires your help. We pray this morning that you would accept our worship. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Steve and Buffy are unable to be with us again this morning, and so we were worship using their recording. Again, we said this last week, but it's just too important not to miss that even in their absence, we don't skip singing because if we skip singing, we no longer have a worship service. And so we gather together to hear the Bible and we also gather together to praise our King. And so let us stand to worship. I cry to you In darkest places I will call Incline your ear to me anew And hear my cry for mercy, Lord For you to count my sinful ways How could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meet 
meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. Surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. So put your hope in God alone. Take courage in his power to save. Completely and forever walk by Christ emerging from the grave. I will wait for you, I will wait for you on your word. I will rely, I will wait for you, surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied now he has come to make a way and God himself has paid the price that all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice i will wait for you i will wait for you on your word i will rely i will wait for you surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied i will You may be seated. Our scripture reading comes from the book of John, chapter 15, beginning in verse 26. John, chapter 15, beginning in verse 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify. For you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can no longer see me. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. 
and he will tell you about what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. The word of our God. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. And if you don't know about Campus Crusade for Christ, it is the largest evangelistic force on the planet. Campus Crusade for Christ, now known as CRU, has more than 25,000 missionaries serving in more than 190 countries. The largest evangelistic force on the planet. And they have one mission that all may hear. The gospel of Jesus. Campus Crusade for Christ has led millions of people to faith and repentance. Millions of people to trust in Christ. Bill Bright, the founder of that ministry, 
was once asked this question, is there anything better is there anything better than seeing people come to faith in Christ? Is there anything better than seeing people come to trust Jesus with their life? And Bill Bright said, yes. Yes. There's actually one thing better than seeing someone come to Christ. One thing better than seeing someone have faith and repentance in Christ. And that one thing better is seeing someone be filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit awakens us to the spiritual life that God has given us. And being filled with the Holy Spirit awakens each person to the mission of Jesus. We continue on in our study of Acts, Acts chapter 2, and this morning we will see the coming of the Spirit and we will see God's people filled with the Spirit. And we will see that it changes them and even changes the church. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phyga, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. In our passage this morning, the Spirit of God has come. The Spirit comes, and for those taking notes, He comes with evidence. That's number one, with evidence. The Spirit comes, and number two, with effect comes with effect. Number three, the Spirit comes with an example. Those are our three points this morning. With evidence, with effect, and as an example. So first, the evidence. There is an evidence to the Spirit's arrival. Evidence that He has come. Suddenly, verse 2, a sound like a blowing and of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. It was sudden, and yet it was unmistakable. The Spirit has come. A few years back, it was a Sunday afternoon. My family, my boys and I were in our family room, and we were watching for the coming storm. We're looking out the window, and before the rain even comes, there's this rush of wind, and then a boom. This wind blew through the neighborhood, and in an instant, it did an incredible amount of damage, knocking down trees. There we were. We were watching, even waiting for the storm. And yet, when it came, it got our attention. That's the idea. The disciples, the early church, they are waiting for the Spirit. Acts chapter 1, wait for the Spirit. They are watching, they are waiting, and when it comes, it comes barreling through. It's unmistakable. And not only is it unmistakable, everything is affected. Notice verse 2 again, it filled the entire house. In the Bible, the word Spirit means breath. Or wind. This is the Spirit of God. The breath of God. 
the wind of God. We could say that the power of God has come upon them. You ever think of the book of Ezekiel? The Spirit of God is hovering over this valley, and in the valley below are all of these dry bones. And these dead bones come back to life. It's the power of God. Think of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit of God is hovering over the deep. God is creating life. Think of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. All Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is the power of God. The Spirit of God. The power of God. The breath of God. The source of God. The life of God. That has come. Not only is there this massive, unmistakable sound, but there's also this visual dimension to it as well. Verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Tongues of fire. In the Bible, fire is oftentimes a visible manifestation of the invisible God. Think of Moses. Moses sees the bush that's on fire and it is not consumed. And Moses says, what's going on here? Who is this? And God says, it's me. Well, she says, I am. When God gave the law on Mount Sinai, the fire itself is consumed with flames of fire. Or when Elijah is taken, taken up into heaven, he is taken up in a chariot of fire. Or Hebrews chapter 12, our God is a consuming fire. The fire of the tongues is a visible manifestation of the invisible God. And this fire, it doesn't just hang around and somehow just hover over them. No, it comes to rest on each of them. The Spirit comes to rest on them, verse 4, and He gives them the ability to speak in other languages. He gives them the ability to communicate the truths of God in different languages. And again, this is not surprising if we know the Old Testament. Whenever the Spirit descended upon someone, it would oftentimes occur with speaking in uncommon ways. Think of the first king of Israel, King Saul. King Saul, the Spirit descends upon him, and he begins to speak for God. And all these people wonder, what's happened to Saul? How can he speak like this? What's happened to him? And what's happened is the Holy Spirit's come over him. The Spirit has come. God sends the Spirit with the noise, with the audio, so they hear it. And he sends it with the visual, so that they could see it. God has done this so they can understand what is taking place place. He is coming with a physical reminder of the inward spiritual reality. And so the Spirit comes with a rushing wind, and it's a physical picture of the spiritual reality. The Spirit comes in power. The Spirit comes with flames of fire. It's a physical picture of the spiritual reality. The Spirit comes with purpose. The Spirit comes to rest on each of them. It's a physical picture of the spiritual reality that the Spirit comes to us personally. The Spirit comes with a physical likeness so that it's unmistakable to all who see it. He has come. And yet His coming is far more than simply for the disciples. His coming is the ushering in of something brand new for His church. Verse 1 is the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th. It's the 50th day after the Passover. The 50th day after Pentecost, it's the feast. And it's the feast of first fruits. The farmers would get their first harvest. And it would be the first of the harvest yet to come. And they'd offer these first fruits to God. How fitting is it that the Spirit of God comes when the people of God remember the first of the harvest yet to come? The Spirit of God comes on the festival of first fruits. 
It's the first of all that is to come. And it's the first of all the amazing things that God is going to do through his spirit inside of his church in the book of Acts. And as we go through the book of Acts, we will see amazing thing after amazing thing after amazing thing. Why? Because the spirit comes in Acts chapter 2. His spirit came and his spirit started something you and I still feel the effects of today. Spirit has come. Spirit of God comes with evidence, and he also comes with effect. It's our second point, the effect of the Spirit. Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses. He said, you're going to go around, and I want you to tell everyone about me. And he says, I want you to tell everyone about me in Jerusalem, and then I want you to go to Judea, then I want you to go to Samaria, and I want you to go even to the ends of the earth. You'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Now, how are you going to tell people about Christ if you don't speak their language? That's the effect of the Spirit. The Spirit comes to equip His people to accomplish His mission. That's the effect of the Spirit. The Spirit comes to equip His people to accomplish His mission. And so He gives them the ability to speak in other languages so that nothing will stop the message of the gospel from going forth. It's as if Jesus is saying, hey, all you got to do is open your mouth. You open your mouth, I'll even put the words in there so that you can accomplish this mission. It's Pentecost. It's this massive feast. And so there's all these different people in the city of Jerusalem, all these different people from many places. That's the idea of verse 8. It just lists all of these places. And they're in Jerusalem, and they all have all these different languages. And apparently, they're there, and they're celebrating, and then they hear this noise. And they hear this rushing, barreling wind, and they run to where it is. And then they hear these Christians speaking their languages, and their Christians are speaking all at once. But it's not confusing. Somehow they pick out, hey, that guy over there, I understand him. He's speaking my language. And so notice that these tongues, these are other known languages. Languages that other people know. You know, this isn't a private prayer language. This isn't a language that only two people know, the one who speaks and the one who interprets. No, these are real, identifiable languages. And they were speaking these languages in order to be a witness to Christ. The role of the Holy Spirit is that he empowers his people to fulfill his mission. They were to be his witnesses. And so the Holy Spirit enables them. He gives them the ability to speak these languages that will fulfill their mandate. And it's all gift. You know, it simply happened. You know, they didn't attend a seminar. They didn't go to a class on how to speak in tongues. The Spirit simply gave them the ability to communicate the truths of the gospel in a language that other people knew who were there. You know, it's absolutely amazing. That's exactly what they say in verse 7. They say, hey, aren't these Galileans? Now, that may not mean a lot to us, but it's actually kind of like this. They say, hey, aren't these the country bumpkins? Aren't these the people that can't even speak their own language? And how are they speaking my language? And yet speaking it so perfectly. These are uneducated, ordinary folk. And they're speaking my language. Those who hear it ask, verse 12, what does it mean? It's like they're hearing this and say, what is that about Jesus? What's that again? Who is this Jesus? Why is this so important? You know, soon they're going to have their questions answered. That's going to be next week. Peter's going to stand up, and he's going to tell them exactly what this means. And Peter's going to preach about Jesus, and he say, Jesus was a man, and he was 
crucified for our sins. And if we trust in his death, if we turn to him in faith and repentance, we can be saved. These people who are here in the early church speaking their languages, they don't have all the details, at least not yet. And so they ask, what does it mean? And they ask, can you tell us more? But sadly, there's some there who are not as curious. Verse 13, some, however, made fun of them, and they said, hey, they just had too much wine. You know, some of these early people 2,000 years ago, some of these early people were modern people. They had no room for the supernatural. And they said, nothing to see here, just some drunk people. You know, that sounded like my language, but that's just coincidental. Just really amazing. It's actually astonishing. They hear the sound, the sound of the wind, and they rush to the early church and they hear them speaking these different languages. And they even say, hey, aren't these the country people? Aren't these the backwoods guys? They see the supernatural and it's amazing. And yet they're absolutely committed to finding a natural explanation somewhere. And so they say, oh yes, it has to be wine. They must be drunk. They dismiss the supernatural. And in so doing, they dismiss the opportunity to see the work of God. Friends, we have people listening this morning from all sorts of different places. Not only different locations, but also different places in life. And there has to be more than one. Probably even in this room, more than one that says, you know, I just don't know about this. You know, if you're here this morning and you don't know about Jesus, I beg you, don't dismiss the supernatural. Don't look for natural causes for the virgin birth. And don't look for natural causes for the miracle. And don't look for natural causes for the resurrection. Don't miss the supernatural. If you miss the supernatural, you miss with it the opportunity to see God. Third, the arrival of the Spirit is an example. The arrival of the Spirit is an example. We see in Acts chapter 2, we see the filling of the Holy Spirit. Or in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And some look at Acts chapter 2, and they see the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they say this is like a second stage to Christianity. And they say the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this is a, a greater outpouring for some. And some look at Acts chapter 2, and they say this needs to be our example. We need to experience this again. We need to be baptized again by the Spirit of God. And, and if, if the Spirit just comes upon us in that way, like if there's tongues of fire and we just begin to speak in tongues, and incredible things are going to happen. And yet the Bible is incredibly clear. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. There is one baptism, and that baptism is into Christ. The New Testament regularly speaks about being baptized into Christ. It's not talking about the outward sign of being dunked in the baptistry behind us. It's talking about the inward reality of the saved person. The one who is saved is enveloped into Christ, caught up into Christ, united with Christ, covered by Christ, baptized into Christ. The baptism into Christ is one and the same with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so being baptized is normal New Testament Christianity. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not some event that happens for more mature or more elite Christians. Every child of God is baptized into the Holy Spirit. This is where Acts chapter 2 differs from our experience. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was different 
for the first Christians. You know, to show the power of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is like, to show the power of what is common to all who are baptized into Christ, to show the power of that, God gives these first Christians the audio and the visual at, at Pentecost. The audio and the visual at Pentecost. He shows these first Christians, these tongues of fire. And he shows these first Christians this incredible wind. And he wants them to see one thing. This is how remarkable it is to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And every child of God experiences this same baptism. Not in a physical way, but in a no less powerful yet spiritual way. You know, these people were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the world's flipped upside down. Peter becomes a great preacher. And the church begins to grow like wildfire. And the gospel spreads to Judea. And then it spreads to Samaria. And even their enemies now confess that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord because they see the effects of the Spirit. And the gospel then spreads to the Gentiles. This is because they have the Spirit. Every child of God is baptized by the Spirit. And yet, and we cannot miss this this morning, even though every child of God is baptized by the Holy Spirit, not necessarily is every child of God filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul tells the Ephesians to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul also tells the Ephesians, do not quench the Holy Spirit. You see, according to the Bible, it's possible to welcome the Spirit into our lives? And even if we are a Christian, it's possible to reject the Spirit. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're equipped to do what the Spirit's calling us to do. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we can experience the same miraculous provisions that they experience in Acts chapter 2. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we are equipped to do what God has called us to do. Now, will we speak in tongues when we're filled like the Holy Spirit? Will we speak in tongues? Well, that's actually the wrong question. The better question is, will I be equipped to tell others about Jesus? And the answer to that is yes. The answer to that is yes. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you can share the gospel with whomever, despite any language barrier or any barrier there other. You know, some application here. Look out in this room, and I know some of you watching at home, and I, I know your stories. I know that some of you long for your family, and you long for your friends to know the gospel. Some of you long to see your children come to faith in Christ. Some of you long for your spouse to come to Christ. Some of you long for your friends to come to faith in Christ. How will that happen? Most likely that will happen when the one who shares with them is filled with the Holy Spirit. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will enable us to speak the very language of the one who is hearing. And he will give us insights into their thoughts. And he will give us insights into their longings and insights into their fears. And he will enable us to share the gospel in the way that they can receive it and understand it. People looked at these Galileans. Hey, aren't these Galileans? Aren't these the uneducated, plain people? And yet they're speaking my language. Friends, that's how the world looks at us. The world looks at us as plain, uneducated, naive, ordinary folk. To many, we are not an impressive bunch. And I don't mean to offend anyone by that, but that's just honest. To many, what we have going on here and who we are, we are not impressive. And so, friends, we need to be filled with the Spirit of God if we ever have any hope at all of sharing the gospel of Christ with others. 
the Spirit, when He fills us, He gives us the ability to communicate the gospel in a compelling way that the world will look at us and say, hey, I thought those were ordinary people and I thought they were just a little bit naive and I thought they really didn't get it, but hey, that now makes sense to me. That's the work of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul tells the Ephesians, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, that actually means you have to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. You ever have a slow drain in your sink at home? The drain drains a little bit slow, so you turn the faucet on, and when the faucet's on, the water begins to rise just a little bit, but as soon as the faucet's off, the water drains out. That's a little bit like the Holy Spirit in our life. When the Holy Spirit is coming in, we begin to fill a little bit, but as soon as we say no to that, we are drained and we are empty and we are spiritually dry. You know what's amazing? They're baptized with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, and as we go through Acts, they are continually filled by the Holy Spirit. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit again in Acts chapter 4. And the early church is filled again with the Holy Spirit at the end of Acts chapter 4. Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit twice that we know of in Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit at least twice that we know of in Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 11. The point is clear. Even for the early church who experienced the miracle of the coming of the Holy Spirit, they have to be continually filled with him. That's true for us. We have to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit to do the work that God has set for us to do. And friends, every time we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's exactly what it says in verse 3, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Every time we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's no less miraculous than what happens in Acts chapter 2. It's no less miraculous. Now, most likely, we're not going to experience the filling of the Holy Spirit with the same audios and the same visual, but we will experience it with the same power. And so the natural question, I hope the question we're asking this morning is this, well, how then can I be filled? You know, if I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and I want His power and I want to be equipped and emboldened to do what He's calling me to do, how do I get it? The first step in being filled with the Holy Spirit is to realize I'm empty. Prior to being filled, we must realize we're empty. It was Jesus who said, or called to worship this morning, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's where it starts. It starts by understanding without Christ, I have nothing. Without Christ, I can do nothing. Apart from Christ, I'm empty. And then when we realize we're empty, then we actually realize our deficiencies. And we realize our need. And when we realize our deficiencies and we realize our need, it's only then that we become desperate for Him. And we are truly desperate for His Spirit. It becomes a commitment to us. And we begin to say, hey, I'm not going anywhere until I get the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's the early church. Jesus is crucified on Passover. He meets with them for 40 days. And then he says, I want you to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. And for 10 days, they wait. And for 10 days, they pray. And for 10 days, they read their Bibles. And for 10 days, they have fellowship with one another. And they say, we are not going anywhere until we get it. That's desperation. I'm empty. Jesus is gone. I have nothing. I need the Spirit. Friends, you know some of the reason that we aren't filled with the Holy Spirit? It's just because we're not that concerned. And we're focused on too many other things. And the early church, they are desperate for the Spirit of God. And they're not going anywhere until they receive it. And they're not focused on other things. They have one 
focus, and that focus is receiving the Spirit of God. And so just being honest, perhaps some of us need to slow down. Perhaps some of us need to get alone with God, and we need to read our Bible, and we need to pray, and we need to pray, God, fill me with your Spirit. Equip me. Embolden me. Empower me. And God, I'm not going anywhere until you do that because I want your spirit more than I want anything. And friends, when that happens, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's almost like a drug. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's this spiritual high. And there's this fire inside of us and there's a passion to do the things of God and there's a passion to have more of God and there's a purpose to our life and we understand that we're a part of God's plan and we understand hey I'm just a cog in the in the machine but at least I'm a part of the machine and I can do what God's called me and made me to do and then we experience the power and we say I can do this or rather God can do this through me and it's amazing this past Wednesday a group of local pastors met for prayer we were praying together and then it happened happened for me and i'm pretty sure it happened to others too we were filled with the holy spirit you know we were praying and we're praying for the city of wastion we're praying for the fulton county and we're praying for our leaders and we're praying for all of these things and then the spirit filled us and there's a heightened sense of passion for this county and for this city. You know, some of the pastors brought their burdens that morning. And the Spirit filled us, and we all left with a sense of purpose. We left encouraging one another. We left being encouraged. We left knowing this is what God is calling us to do, and this is our mission, and He has made us for it. And there was a power when he filled us, his power came over us. And it was like, let's get going. Like God's called us. This. Let's share the gospel. And let's see what God does. You know, that's the filling of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's miraculous. And yet it's also ordinary. Miraculous and yet ordinary. You know, in God's mercy, the filling of the Holy Spirit happens often. Happens often in meetings like that. It's ordinary, even though it's miraculous. The filling of the Holy Spirit happens often. And it can happen often in our life. And all we have to do is to beg God that it might and when it does, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, there is power. And when we experience that power, we are never the same. It's ordinary. And yet it's miraculous. Let's pray. Father God, we pray this morning that you would fill your people with your spirit. Father, we pray that we would be men and women. And even boys and girls who would regularly and consistently beg you that you might fill us. We pray that we'd be more in tune with you. And we pray that we'd have a greater hunger for your word. And we pray that we would experience more of your presence. And we pray that we would be emboldened and equipped and even have a greater desire to share your faith with others. Father, we pray in your mercy fill us. We pray trusting in you. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. After the benediction, an usher will dismiss you, but no one's asking you to leave. And if you want to sit right here, if you want to beg God that he might fill you this morning, that might be a very appropriate thing to do. Hear this benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. 
I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. An usher will dismiss you. Go in the power of the Spirit.